Hello everyone, thanks very much for having me at the Scottish Microscopy Symposium. It's so lovely to e be here. My name is Luke Daly, I'm a lecturer at the School of Geographical and Earth Sciences at the University of Glasgow. And in this talk, I'm going to be talking you through some of the sort of like nanomineralogical exploration we've been doing of materials brought back by sample return missions from out in our solar system to get an atom's eye view of how our solar system forms. Now, as planetary scientists, one of the key things we're trying to answer is how do we form a solar system? How do we go from a big ball of gas and dust to collapse that down to form a star in the center with a swirling disk of gas and dust around it, known as a protoplanetary disk? How that dust and gas comes together to form the first rocks, to form the first asteroids, to form the first protoplanets, and how they interact to form the planetary system that we observe today with a third rock from the sun that has life on it, but it's arguably intelligent. My view is most of the action actually happens in the first 10 million years of solar system history, in this protoplanetary disk stage, because in the protoplanetary disk, a lot of stuff is happening. You've got the swirling disk of, disk of gas and dust, a vast temperature gradient where we've got the very high temperatures quite close to the young sun, as you might expect, through to very, very cold temperatures out uh, in the outer portions of our solar system. This gives rise to what's known as the proverbial snow line is one of the most important aspects of the protoplanetary disk and a key thing for life on Earth. Essentially out with of the snow line, water is in the solid phase, it's in ice, and in with of the snow line, water is in the vapor phase, it's a gas. Um, and this has substantial implications for the origin of water on Earth, because Earth formed in with of the snow line. It formed where water is in the gas phase, and so that water should have been lost to the outer solar system as it's blown out by energetic solar winds in the early solar system. So Earth should have formed dry, which is completely at odds with the pale blue dot we see today that's really nice and habitable and lovely. Uh, so one of the key questions we have in planetary science is where did Earth get its water from? How do we get the pale blue dot? There's some interesting ideas about sort of nebula ingassing, potentially in that hot in a solar system environment, maybe you could absorb water uh, onto the surfaces of grains and incorporate that into the Earth that way. Um, however, most ideas have tended to focus on extraterrestrial sources, such as throwing comets at it. They were the poster boy for a long time. Big, dirty snowballs, have a bunch of water, throw them at the Earth, job done. However, water-rich asteroids may have a part to play in this, these asteroids that are relatively water-rich. Um, and also a recent kind of idea is potentially the sun could get involved by irradiating particles through the solar wind and injecting water into their outer mineral surfaces. Um, all of this comes together to basically try and explain the problem graph, which is the deuterium hydrogen ratio. Deuterium just being a heavy variety of hydrogen or heavy water. Earth kind of sits around here. Water rich asteroids sit slightly heavier. Uh, they are consistent with another protoplanet called Vesta, again, isotopically heavier. And comets, the poster child for water on Earth, are really high, really heavy uh, water involved in those, very high dH ratios. The key problem in all of this is none of those three things can come together to make the Earth. You can't add three heavy things to get a lighter thing. Annoyingly, the only thing on the other side of this graph is the Sun. Um, and now I'm not suggesting we throw the sun at the Earth because that would be bad for everybody involved, but we need some way of balancing this isotopic book. We need a light deuterium hydrogen ratio reservoir to balance the heavy water rich uh, asteroids and cometary contributions. And that's where a process called space weathering comes in. Space weathering is a process that affects every surface exposed to the vacuum of space. So that includes the solar wind, that stream of hydrogen ions, as well as ultraviolet rays. It includes micrometeorite impacts, as well as galactic cosmic rays that are sort of from the death of giant stars. These affect every surface of, uh, exposed to the vacuum of space. So that's things like comets, Mercury, the moon, billionaire's car, apparently, uh, and the asteroid Itakawa, or indeed any asteroid. I'm going to focus on the asteroid Itokawa because this was the subject of a sample return mission where the Japanese space agency sent a probe called Hayabusa to land on this asteroid and bring back brought, and brought back 300 individual particles. And we have been lucky enough at Glasgow to get to measure those to explore the space weathering process. And that brings me on to sample return missions, these really important missions to try and answer these key questions. Uh, space agencies like NASA, like JAXA, are sending out probes, like Hayabusa to the asteroid Itakawa, like Stardust to comets, like ongoing missions, including OSIRIS-REx, which is a NASA mission to the asteroid Bennu, and Hayabusa 2, which is a JAXA mission to the asteroid Ryugu, two water-rich bodies to bring back material to understand their isotopic composition, particularly their deuterium hydrogen ratio. Recently, like literally the other week, the OSIRIS-REx mission did its touch and go on the asteroid Bennu, kicked off a load of sediment, 
captured a substantial amount of it, way more than they bargained for. So they've got a beautiful, pristine sample of this asteroid to bring back to Earth in 2023. However, this is not the only material we've got to go on. While we're waiting for this to come back, space comes to us all the time in the form of these beautiful fireball events that drop meteorites out of the sky. Meteorites are samples of these asteroids, particularly the chondrites, the stony meteorites. Uh, we think they come from those water-rich asteroids, so we can study them to understand asteroidal processes and potentially understand delivery of water to Earth. However, these have substantial problems when you try to measure them in terms of their texture and their mineralogy because they are complicated at every scale. They're incredibly heterogeneous materials. If you look at a centimeter scale slab, there is complexity all over the place, which becomes a problem because these meteorites are very rare. You only get, as a scientist, tends to be around a centimeter scale block. So you might miss some of the complexity at the large scale. However, there's plenty enough complexity going in at the millimeter scale, uh, including these beautiful chondrules, uh, which are sort of the first uh, lavas in our solar system. They're texturally diverse. The matrix is chemically and mineralogically heterogeneous. And that problem just keeps getting worse. You go down to the micrometer scale, you continue to see even more complexity. Down at the nanometer scale, you start to give up with this nano mineralogical hellscape. Um, and uh, Fortunately, unfortunately, uh, advances in microscopy techniques have allowed us to start accessing the picometer scale and it just gets worse. Um, what we want to do ultimately is measure everything and throw, and particularly for these sample return materials, throw the book at them so we can characterize their and quantify their textures, their mineralogy and their components at every scale. And that's where correlative microscopy comes in using something like X-ray computer tomography to get the 3D uh, sort of rock scale textures SEM, scanning electron microscopy, to look at the sort of chemistry and textures at the centimeter scale, electron backscatter diffraction to quantify the crystallographic relationships, then using a focused ion beam to dig out small materials to get at the sort of like micrometer to nanometer scale using transmission Kikuchi diffraction or transmission electron microscopy, looking at atomic defects, uh, etc. And the sort of icing on the cake of all of this is a kind of new kid on the block called atom probe tomography. Uh, now, if you haven't heard of atom probe tomography before, it is a relatively new technique in planetary science, but it's been around in material science for ages. Uh, essentially, you put a very fine needle in an ultra high vacuum at high voltage, fire a laser at that tip. That gives that sample just enough energy to ionize a single atom. That atom then fires across a potential difference to hit a position sensitive detector. The time of flight from laser pulse to detection gives you the mass and charge of the uh, atom, which gives you the elements and isotope of that atom, which is really awesome and really important. And the position it hits on the detector, uh, you can back out its 3D position within that sample. So you end up with a data set like the one rotating behind me, which uh, uh, each one of those dots is an individual atom. There are 23 million atoms in this data set. And you can start seeing literal nano scale diversity uh, and heterogeneity within these kind of samples. Uh, to give you an idea about how small we're talking, that's a human hair, which is about 100 microns across. And I'm going to put a atom probe needle diameter by means of a red dot. Uh, so hopefully you all can't see that. So understand that we're talking about really, really small objects and really, really small uh, heterogeneities here. Uh, to prepare a sample, you need a focused ion beam to mill out a triangular wedge, kind of like a Toblerone shaped object. You attach a portion of that wedge to a pre-grown silica post and then use an annular milling pattern to mill uh, the sides of that wedge away until you are left with a needle that's 100 nanometers in diameter. Now we're interested in space weathering of these particles that have been brought back from uh, sample return missions from asteroids and so we're really interested in that surface so we add an extra layer of protection to make sure we analyze that outer surface uh, in that atom probe and that's by using a protective capping layer of chromium which has the same ionization potential as our mineral we're interested in, in this case it's olivine and we can see that in the fib and so we stop milling when we have just a little bit of the chromium cap left and we can start milling through that in our atom probe analysis and know when we transfer from the chrome into our mineral proper and see that uh, outer space weathered surface. Um, atom probe, as a sort of a little bit more detail, uh, is detection limits of one atomic part per million. So if you have one atom of interest uh, in every million atoms, you will see it. Uh, you also don't seem to have the uh, mass fractionation problems of other mass spectrometry techniques. You get 100% ionization of the whole periodic table. And really importantly for us, uh, you get to detect molecular species, including OH and water, which is really important for understanding space weathering.
Space weathering on the nanoscale using TEM looks a bit like this. You have this amorphous layer on the order of 100 nanometers. This is a study from Bradley et al. Uh, and he used eels on these circular voids known as vesicles to look at the volatiles within them. And he noticed uh, you had this kind of OH bond in the veal spectrum, which is really awesome. And tints that you have water uh, forming within these space weathered surfaces. And this gives us a kind of very simple formula for this uh, whole process as you have protons derived by the solar winds, uh, you add those to rocks uh, in space and they produce water on the outer surface. Essentially those protons go in, boot out a cation like iron or magnesium and nick an oxygen producing OH. Another, ion, uh, another hydrogen ion comes in, uh, they join together to produce H2O or water. Um, and so what we would expect to see if we have a particle that's space weathered, um, brought back by some of these sample return missions, we put a rock in space, uh, its outer surface would get slightly damp. Uh, if we sort of have a more serious example of looking at a natural rock, its outer sort of 40 to 100 nanometers should be enriched in water. And that's what we're hoping to see in the atom probe. We took our particle from Itakawa, as well as a standard uh, San Carlos olivine of the same mineralogy, and bombarded that with deuterium ions to simulate the solar wind, as well as leaving one just in the lab to do nothing, to just double check that we hadn't terrestrially contaminated it in any way. Uh, our TEM results uh, from a sort of nearby area show this is a relatively immature space weathering rim. You haven't destroyed uh, your crystal structure, it's still crystalline, but you do see some of that sort of like density differences in the HAADF image. Um, our standard results from Atom Probe is kind of where things get really interesting though. The one we left in the lab, which is the one on the left, didn't do anything. You can see the nice chromium capping layer uh, going through into these teal uh, OH uh, atoms and these blue H2O atoms. There's no change at that upper surface, so no terrestrial contamination there. The deuterium irradiated San Carlos, you see a substantial drop off in hydrogen and OH, but a massive kick up in D, D2, DO and D2O. So that heavy water is there and kind of is a dead ringer for this deuterium irradiation producing water in the outer surface of minerals. Then we come on to Itakawa, we're expecting to see this sort of outer layer and that is exactly what we see uh, in these OH, and H2O atoms, we see this enrichment in the near surface near that chromium layer exactly as we would expect. Uh, the amount of water we can quantify uh, in this outer surface is on the order of about one atomic, uh, one atomic percent, which is a lot. And if you sort of do the maths about how much water you can put into particles of different sizes like we do here, okay, meteorites, you're not going to do much. If you've got a fifth size objects, 100 nanometers of water is neither here nor there. But if you are less than 10 micrometers in size, like the majority of meteorite matrix and the majority of small particles uh, in the extraterrestrial environment, you can get between 0.1 and 1% extra water from the solar wind into these particles, which is basically the whole water budget of that particle. Uh, in fact, if you take it to Kyle as an example, and you said, okay, let's have one meter cubed of regolith, how much water would I have from this process? You're talking on the order of 20 liters per meter cubed. So this is substantial. And this got us thinking, maybe this could be a reservoir to help explain uh, this isotopic composition because this water is derived from the solar wind, which is derived from the sun, and so should be isotopically light. Um, what's important though to uh, think about though is the flux of material to the earth every year. We have about 50,000 tons impact the earth's atmosphere every year. Very little of it is actually meteorites. Uh, you get a few sort of like comet asteroid sized objects over time. The vast majority, like 99 to 95% of it, is these small particles that would contain a substantial amount of solar wind derived water. And so if we go back to this graph and we say, okay, what if the sun can produce a, de a solar deuterium hydrogen ratio in small particles and you add them to the earth and allow those three variables, those comets, those water rich asteroids, and those small particles, and what is the combination? that we can use to produce Earth's oceans. And you essentially end up with this ternary diagram uh, with this blue region, which so, shows the range of possibilities where you can mix solar wind derived small particles, carbonaceous chondrite or water rich asteroids and comets together to explain Earth's oceans. And so now we have a essentially a complete model. We have that light reservoir. You can have a little bit of comet, mostly water rich asteroids, but as long as you add a little bit of small particles irradiated by the sun, producing water in their outer shell, you can add that to the Earth and explain Earth's ocean composition. Thanks very much for listening. Uh, I'd like to thank all my collaborators uh, that sort of support me to do all this really fun work. Um, I'm sorry I can't be there in person. I'm in two places once right now. I'm teaching a lab, but if you have any questions, 
please feel free to email me or tweet at me and I'll be happy to answer them there. Thanks once again so much for having me and hopefully see you in person all very soon. Cheers.